Cool. Um, hi, everybody. I'm here with uh, James Hunt. Um, I'm not the racing driver. But... <laughs> oh, great start. <laughs> Sorry, man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you would be an amazing racing driver. I think. Look, look at this. I'm even very formal with this shit. When I actually went to that movie, Rush. Do you remember that movie? Yeah. And I felt like standing up at the end and going, I'm James Hunt. You're James Hunt? <laughs> you are James Hunt. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but, anyway. Yeah, so James and I worked together um, at Auckland Light Rail and um, AT Eastern Busway. He's uh, probably the best risk manager and project controls manager I know that's out there in New Zealand, I reckon. Oh, thanks, mate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, James, thank you so much for being here, mate. Really appreciate it. Appreciate your time. Yeah. yeah. Um, Tell us a bit more about yourself, mate. What do you do? Oh, look, it was, it's funny, you know, introducing myself and how on earth it is that I ended up involved in construction. Yes. It's just crazy. I did a master's degree in history. I was playing rugby full time. You know, and I've always sort of said to people, you've got to have your, have your mind and your heart open to what might come to you. 100%. But the fact that I ended up working in construction is something I would have never, never anticipated. So I actually met through various contacts, a guy who'd employed somebody that I knew we had a chat, I found it, and I was living in the UK at the time playing rugby. Yep. And I found that the culture over there was that you find clever people and then you teach them how to do something, you know? Why not? And, um, and so he obviously thought I had, you know, had the ability. He, it turned out he ran a little risk consultancy. Yeah, right. That their main focus area was projects that were sort of in that funding phase, looking for funding, developing, developing a scheme. And the stated mission really was to make sure that projects got the right amount of money. Yep. Um, they did that, of course, by doing really detailed financial risk analysis, right. detailed program risk analysis, and you know, pulling, pulling all that together and yep. trying to form plans for how you could successfully deliver jobs, right. take them through feasibility, often to the treasury, and, and, and these were really big, big jobs. So yep. he lived down in Dorset somewhere. I got, he put me on the train and I spent the weekend with him and then I started on a Monday. Wow. So quite, quite interesting. two days of training. So it's a history professional and you got into risk. Well, I wasn't, I wasn't a professional at anything. Oh, right, okay. I'd, I'd never had a real, rugby player. I'd never had a real job, so, right. so I went into this project on Monday, and I, and I remember on like the second day, yeah. we were doing like some group activity, and I got chucked into the same group as the project director. Wow. That so, <laughs> so I was thinking, right. <laughs> well, yeah, cheers. This is going to finish pretty soon, potentially, yeah. or it's going to go the other way. <laughs> Ended up working out okay, though. Yeah, right. How, how long have you been doing it? Cheers, cheers. mate. Right, so that was... 17 years ago now. Wow. Um, so I spent probably the first 10 years sort of exclusively working in risk. Yep. And as I say, on big, big projects. So incorporated cross rail and East London Line Extension project, a bit of stuff out at the um, at Heathrow Airport. I, I didn't know um, you worked at Heathrow. Well, yeah, okay. only for a short time. And yeah. then a bit of stuff also around, you know, some schemes that were in really early stages. There was a cross river tram. Yep which I, I don't think ever saw the, light, saw the light of day. Yeah. There was a West London tram that was similar, got, got put right. on the shelf pretty quickly. And then back in New Zealand, worked for AT for a little bit when I first got back. That's right, yeah. Then on to Waterview. And then I was actually working for Connell Dow when I was at Waterview and then got picked up by Fletcher's at the end of that process. And so yep. that's when I first ran into you. Yeah, that's it, yeah. I, I was at Combe when you were doing that. Yeah, that's right. And then a bit of time on CRL, a bit of time at Pitatahi, and then probably for the last 12 months I've been running my own gig. Yeah, how's that going? Yeah, it's interesting. It's an interesting yeah. process. I mean, you've been through something similar recently, I yeah. guess. Um, it's interesting because I've had work yep. consistently, oh, yep. more than I could handle. Yep. But at the same time, it's not necessarily work that's quite as aspirational as what I was doing as a full-time employee, I guess. Right. So I've got to find a way to work myself into those spaces, I guess. And yeah, yeah. And where yeah. I can be a bit more influential. But you do take, do take a bit of a side seat when you're a consultant. You know, you're making a lot of recommendations to other people who make decisions. Yep. And that has its frustrations, but um, there's some great people out there too, you know. So yeah, yeah. I mean, talk, talk us through that journey of you transitioning from a full-time employee to um, a consultant. Was it scary? Was it, what, what were the challenges you faced? What, what was interesting about it? Um, How was that journey for you? Well, my first appointment was the one at Light Rail where, um, yeah. where I was working with you. And it was, it was pretty much like being in a permanent role. Yeah, okay. It, it didn't have, um, it was straight into a situation where I had a full set of responsibilities and it was really yep. clear. Yep. And away we went. So I remember at the end of that, as I started to near the end of that period, it was a six month posting. You, I started to think, well, you know, am I a businessman? Is this a business? Am I, 
Yeah. Is this what I want? Is it the right thing for me? Yeah. And I and even though I work in risk, I, I probably hadn't seen myself as as entrepreneurial or or as a risk taker as such. So. You know, there's an uncertainty about it, but at the same time, I realised that the certainty you get from having a corporate employer is not really as certain as you think it is either. It's it's not. It's you get yeah. one month notice. Yeah, exactly. And, and so sometimes, yeah. yeah, sometimes you think, look, am I better off managing that, managing yeah. that for myself, and saying I'm the person who will find the work rather than exactly right. You know, making yourself the passenger on somebody else's journey. You know. Yeah, yeah. So was I'm it was so scary for you though? I like, I mean, you you don't know where your next paycheck is going to come from. Was um, that was that daunting? Was that I think that, it that never, uncertainty. Well, the interesting thing is, no matter how much, I mean, work I win for want of a better phrase, it never leaves you that idea that, you know, that it could be that you don't have anything next week or next month. Or yeah. Even though most of the appointments I've had have been reasonably long term, I mean, there hasn't been much that was was short term. Yeah, right. They've all been sort of, well, as I say, there's only been three clients, and they're all still <laughs> yeah. interested to a certain extent. Fair enough. Yeah. So. I mean, um, for, for me, it's been <laughs> it's, it's scary, right? So I, I started asking myself when, when I was setting up strategic planning, I was going, shit, I have no idea where my next paycheck's going to come from. Mm. Is this the right thing for me to do? I'll, I'll, it's COVID world, right? I oh, didn't know when the next yeah. lockdown was going to happen. And I was going, holy shit, is, am I actually doing and this? You only just had your baby. Um, yes, well, the, not too long ago. And oh, by the way, I'm expecting another one. Oh. <laughs> Oh, we are, Cara and me, actually, mate. In, in yeah. three weeks, by the way. But, nice. um, oh, I knew about that one. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, um, one was coming on the way. But um, it was the same. Yeah, so, yeah, it was, it was quite scary for me to actually start. And that's when I started with the whole personal branding stuff. And it's, it's really oh. helped me, by the way. No, I The attention seekers, these guys are oh, awesome. I've seen. I've yeah. seen. <laughs> You've seen? I've seen my daily I'll basis. Really, here's a challenge, mate. Pull out your phone, go on LinkedIn, four scrolls. And if you don't see a post to me, I'll let these guys know. <laughs> see they're doing their job. Right? I'll put some feedback on that. First post of the day, every day. <laughs> First post of the day, every day. <laughs> epic, epic. It's interesting though, it's, it's identity forming for sure. Yeah. And because I know that you've got a pretty clear idea. I mean, the challenge for me a little bit is I'm, I'm not quite as clear on what it is that I'm offering. Right. And... When you look at how your career is developing, I mean, my career was very much developing in a leadership context more than as a practitioner. Yep. When you transition into a consultancy type role, you you know you're becoming more of a doer again. Yeah, yeah. And so you are the my doer. You personal are yeah my personal identity around what type of career path I was following. Yep. Probably means that if I was initially marketing myself, I, I probably I would market the wrong things. Right. Whereas if I said, "Hey, I'm a program guru. That's what I love doing." Yeah. You know, that's an easier thing to. To form to, identity to, around? To put a box around. Yeah, whereas, I, whereas I would have you. said, I'm a great guy in an organisation to leverage the best that you can from your project controls and systems in order to get good project outcomes. Yeah. That very much forms you as somebody who is a leader of other people as opposed to as necessarily doing things yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, there's some challenges in that, but I might find that there's a sweet spot somewhere where I can occupy that space. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, for yeah, sure. No, I'm, um, I hope you set up an amazing consultancy mm. um, some some stage in the future. Yeah, but anyways, man, let's let's talk about risk a little bit now. Yeah. Right? So, and um, for everybody that doesn't understand exactly what risk management entails, can you tell us what a day in your life looks like as a risk manager, or as a yeah? Um, what do you what do you do? What what value do you bring to an organisation as a risk manager? So I mean, risk. I mean, if you want to go to the sort of academic situation they call it sort of the effect of uncertainty on your objectives yeah so i used to even when my even if my kids sort of asked me you know what do you do i'd always ask them the question well right so even from the moment you get up in the morning and you make a plan to go to school you've got an idea of how your day pans out yeah however you know things happen yeah, oh, yeah. For one of a better phrase, and I, I used to give presentations on this, you'd love this. I went to a big, important person conference, a whole heap of corporate heads, and my first slide just said, you know, why do we do risk management? Press the button, and it says, shit happens, and it's flashing. <laughs> and then I sort of had another slide which just said, you know, we're, we're dealing, what, what type of shit are we talking about? Yep. And, you know, no matter what plan you make, you know, things will happen. 100%. So the, con the concept of risk management... <laughs> yeah. Obvious is, is, is before you set out 
or in the process of setting out, you're actually thinking about what those things might be yep. and trying to increase your chance of success by understanding those risks, right. putting plans in place. And you know, there, there, there's plenty of issues with risk management in terms of you know, your imagination is limited to what you've experienced or what you can foresee, and the whole nature of it is that it's things that you don't expect. Yep. And sometimes things that you do expect, but occurring in a different way to what you expect. Yep. Or you know that, or, or you know that something might happen, and for whatever reason, circumstances led to you not being able to manage it as effectively yeah. as you might at that time. So, you know, on a daily basis, my life largely consists of, of discussions and conversations with people about risk, about the things that might be affecting them. Um, you need to become an expert at hanging out with experts and listening and being able to extract from them different items. I've found yeah. COVID has been interesting for me because... Is it? How so? Well, just because when you're someone who operates sort of with, without ownership, yeah. you've got to create relationships. Right. And when we live in the COVID world, you've got to schedule your relationship for yeah. me. You can't just um, be in the tea room and Andy walks in and you can have a yarn and you can form a relationship. Yeah. And then I've always had a bit of a saying, and, and, and it works for my consultancy as well, is you join to know people before you ask for something. 100%. Have a relationship before you're yeah. asking them for something. So I worked really hard to make sure I had relationships with all these people because soon yeah. I was going to be asking them for time. First yeah, thing yeah. I was going to be asking them for was for time. And, you know, their time is precious. Oh, absolutely. I, mean, I couldn't agree with you more. It's like, you know, um, I spend most of my days, daytime, building those relationships as well. Oh. And like, I mean, it's, it's, um, it's pretty challenging when you're running your own consultancy, right? You, you spend all this time, unbillable time, that you actually form right. relationships. Um, and then you've got to do work. And you've got well, to dedicate time to your family. Yeah, of course. So the, the less fun part, of course, is after those discussions that there is actually things to be written. Yeah. And so I spend a, a lot of time writing down, forming things. And, and it's largely because um, our industry expectation is that it's not just that you manage risk, it's that you explain how it is that you're managing risk and you yeah. demonstrate that you are managing risk. So my okay. process helps people to, Can we dig into to that demonstrate a that. Yeah. So okay. How See, so let's say you walk into a major, major construction project and you identify this risk. How do you understand the last person in the shovel understands the risk he's dealing with or consequences for inaction? Look, how, how do you communicate that risk is what I'm asking. How do you pass that message down, downstream and upstream to manage identified risks? Well, I mean, this... It's interesting because there's things called risk registers, obviously. 100%, but who reads a register? Yeah, yeah, so let's be honest. Risk <laughs> registers are a, uh, can often be compliance documents rather than living documents. Yep. And so the argument for risk in terms of the value that is added and the ability to make sure, as you say, that people want to participate. Yes. I've always been a big, um, a big fan. I've got a few sort of personal sayings that I manage by, and I think I've probably talked to you about them before. But one of the key ones is, is from a song lyric I stole from somewhere. I don't even remember the song or the artist or anything. Right. But the lyric was, what I can't hold by love, I won't hold with force. And what she's referring to is relationships, of course, where right. she said, don't, don't form obligations, form yeah. relationships where people want to be with you. Right. And they'll want to be with you because you're fun and your relationship adds value to their lives. Yep. If you make them obliged, you just bang the table and say, you've got to do this. Exactly. Or you owe me. Yep. No one wants to be part of that. They'll avoid you. And so what I do with the risk process, of course, is, is you have to find a way to incentivize participation in the process through seeing value, through, through me actually helping them to see that value and maybe doing a little more for them to help them through it. So, you know, I'm not an expert in what it is that that person's doing, but yes. I can certainly help them to unpack things. Sometimes risk management can be a vehicle. You know, yep. you talked about the flow of information up. Yep. People are terrified of conflict, especially in New Zealand culture. Very terrified and of conflict. She'll be yeah, all right. She'll amazing. never be all right. Yeah. <laughs> we just tend to stay silent. And yeah. the risk management process is a great way to, in a non-confrontational way, elevate something that needs to be spoken about. So I'm happy to sell people that vehicle. I'll even go to people who I know have things they want to say yeah. and say, wait a second, here's a chance for you to express that without, right. without actually having to go and have the conversation. Yeah. So, you know, the risks pop up. Yeah, yeah. They get put in front of the right people, supposedly, and as a result, we've now got a conversation that might bring a benefit. Interesting. Now, of course, there's pain. Pain is a motivator. Yeah. And I don't mean pain in a, in a nasty sense. I mean pain as in knowing what the potential impact of your inaction will be. Yeah, you, you quantify it. Yeah, of course. So we quantify risks as well, obviously, and form yeah. um, 
that's the other large part of my job is obviously the, the analysis perspective. So that's building, you know, building detailed models that are going to talk to you about the yeah. impact of individual risks and also the impact of risk collectively. Yeah. So that, as I say, that's where I learned, and, I, and I'm sort of pleased, pleased to come up through risk. And a little bit like program, you get to interact with all the different disciplines. Yeah, yeah. You're, not conf you're not confined to being a specialist in some small area of engineering or something like that. Yeah. And that's why I actually think we under we underrate the potential of people who've come through this pathway as project leaders, mm -hmm. because of the fact that they've had to experience, you know, deep under get, get a deep understanding of the commercial aspects, deep understanding of the contract, deep understanding of what's happening technically, deep understanding of the other, you know, other project support systems. Yeah. And that's that's a really strong footprint. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. So it makes you, you know, can make you a really good generalist mm. and a, and a good person for leveraging on expertise. Yeah. And yeah, interesting. Hmm. Mm. So, so what you're telling me is, risk management is all about absolute uncertainty, and you're managing that uncertainty. Yeah, I mean, that, that you're trying to. You're, you're trying your best. Um, I mean, one thing I've come to realise is not just about manageable uncertainty, but sort of unmanageable uncertainty. Exactly. So, you know, you, so there's one thing that's certain, that's uncertainty. Yeah, I, th I think we try and, we and, try and, and pretend. It must be a really challenging job quantifying that, right? It is, because you don't have a lot more information to draw on other than what has happened to other projects. Or exactly, you're basing it off history. Yeah, and, and you, so you start to, to form some guidelines around what you might expect an uplift to be on a project yep. that's at a certain stage. Yeah. But there's you know so many other factors, and we've been challenged by that, particularly in New Zealand recently, because we're dealing with you know rampant inflation, and yep. it's it's really difficult to try and apply percentage uplift because how do you yeah it's it's the the predictive yeah. aspects become that much harder yeah 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 and well, you know now we're dealing when I think about what we're dealing with resource wise and so on as well it's just and I mean resource as in human resource the potential for people to go overseas yeah I I get the sense that the COVID net benefit will go to other countries. <laughs> You New reckon? Zealand. Yeah, I don't. I don't see New Zealand as being a particularly attractive. Um, I, I think I'll, I'll have to agree with you there. I mean, uh, when when you when your, your, your personal tax is what thirty nine percent now. Yeah, interesting. Eighteen months ago, I would have said differently when it looked like yeah. New Zealand was a bit of a star. Yeah. But I think the economic realities now probably make some of the overseas destinations a bit more attractive to the. Where would you go? Where would I go? Yeah. Oh. If you had, if you're given a choice, free rent. Don't tell me America. No, I mean, America's an option for us, but for oh, other, yeah, other reasons, yeah. Um, but, yeah. Um, I mean, I did love living and working in the UK. Did you? Yeah, yeah and I'd probably, I'd probably look at Australia maybe as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, but it's an interesting aim. I mean, from a construction perspective, I definitely feel like it's a conversation, again, we've had before that, you know, we work in this project expertise yeah. rather than in the expertise of being an engineer or something exactly. like that. And I, and I feel like New Zealand hasn't quite got that balance yet. They value much more... The person who delivers... The person who's delivering, which is great. Exactly, which is... But, um, but I think there's a much, much bigger role to be played by people who are experts in, in helping those people in delivery to work better. Absolutely, you know, enabling them to succeed. Yeah, is, so I um, had a um, great conversation with a guy who I'm sure you'd probably know, a guy, Callum McCorkadale. Oh. Callum McCorkadale is his name, and I right. met him at Waterview. Yeah, right. And he's a lean construction specialist. Yeah, right, okay. And he does a wonderful job of helping people to plan their work better, yeah. you know, to be more efficient and to have good flow and, and mm. those sorts of things. But of course he says, you know, New Zealanders are just a bit reluctant to really plan, a bit it reluctant is, yeah, to yeah. really put the effort into planning. And the problem with that is that if we don't plan as well, our project outcomes aren't as good, yeah. our profit margins aren't as good, and we can't reinvest in people to become better project yeah. managers. So that's part of this whole issue we're facing in the industry with the way the you know the contractors aren't making any money, is that they can't get any better because they can't invest in the auxiliary services that would make them better at delivering projects. Right. So it's sort of a cyclical thing where we have to keep cutting overhead, but the overhead's vital in order to support yep. you know better operation. Do you think it's just the overheads, or do you think there's a cultural problem? Um, yeah, there's probably a bit of that too. I mean, I was pretty fortunate in that. Um, the Waterview project in particular was a really, and I, and I say innovative space, I mean, had a, it's a bit like people talk about the All Blacks. Why are the All Blacks so good? Well, the All Blacks are yeah. so good because of consistent execution of the basics. It's not actually the flash stuff. Yeah. It's that they do the basics exceptionally well. Exactly. And, and it's people, more of a mindset thing with them as well, isn't it? And people Completely think with programming. Yeah. Well, 
like there's this idea somehow that you'll, you'll project, present something that people will see as innovation. Oh wow! <laughs> but actually, it's really just being good at the at the basics. Do the 100%. basics well, and then you can build your house upon it. You know. Exactly. And I've, I've always said that I don't do anything crazy. I just do the fundamentals absolutely, absolutely, really well. Just set the ground. Get a work breakdown structure. Get a cost breakdown structure. Get a model breakdown structure. An org breakdown structure. Tie them yeah. all together. The world's a happy place. And it's funny, though, isn't it? How um, like Pitatahi was really interesting because they really valued engineering and you, I mean, sorry, valued innovation and you right. saw that. Mm -hmm. You know, it was one of the KRAs, it was right up there, Yeah. innovation. And there were some really cool innovations. Yeah. But I think the focus on innovation took them away from let's get the basics in place. Yeah. Let's get really good, consistent basis in place and then let's worry about the flash stuff. Yeah, right. And so I think there was a realisation partway through the job, hey, let's go back a little bit and just really get our systems up and running, get them pumping, yeah. and then, and then innovate. start to look yeah. at what the Have stretch. you ever heard the saying, innovation for the sake of innovation is dangerous? I haven't. <laughs> <I'll be honest. laughs> it's true. It's, it's actually true. Innovation and for the sake of innovation is dangerous without having your fundamentals set right. That's what, yeah. that's what that actually yeah. means, you know? So why would you push forward to try and create something really, really cool when you've got a really unstable foundation? Yeah, it's, it's funny too. I, one thing I rallied against, um, that was sort of considered the sexy thing at the time was this whole real time, real time information and in, in projects. Yep. And I don't know whether you've attempted this, um, but it's this <laughs> idea of you know daily updates, daily updates, and you can press the button and you can drill it and you know exactly where we're at. Sure. <laughs> really interesting. Yep. And and I think conceptually it might work. Yep. But the problem is, you know, projects are based on progress. Mm -hmm. And knowing where you are right now is actually worthless to you unless you know where, your where you were is. yesterday or we, and, and how much closer you are or yeah. further away or whatever. Everything needs to be contextualized that way. So personally, you know, there's a whole heap of project metric that we start to provide on jobs because you, you might be told they want this and they want that and they want yeah. whatever. But you tend to find that the most successful project outcomes come because you've found somebody who might only be interested in two or three key metrics. Exactly. And they keep smashing those. That's it. Yeah, what's that? And, and what, what have we always said? That? 15 key milestones on a, on a major project? Yeah, something like that. 15 key milestones. It's, like, it's a bit like Google as well, right? So you know when, you, when you're, driving, you're driving down a motorway and there's a massive traffic jam but Google's found another route to your destination. But if you didn't know where your destination was, how would Google know to reroute you? You know what I mean? That's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> um, and <laughs> it, it, it is, man. I, mean, I, I don't know, man. I, I've, I've related everything I do to Google. Like, like I see them... And the way the way they've set up their entire organization is brilliant. Okay, but um, because because what I do is not very different to what Google does. Is that what strategic planning is going to look like as an organization? Hundred so. percent, <laughs> bang on. <laughs> <laughs> Be the next fucking Google. Mm. <laughs> Oops, <laughs> said the word fuck. Have to beep that one. Yeah, <laughs> they'll probably edit it. But um, mm. yeah, no, it's um, it's it's hundred percent Google because because what do I do as a Person, I, I try and get the right information to the right person at the right time to enable a data-driven decision. Yeah. Yeah. What does Google do? It's the yeah. same thing. And I mean, What's and, the risk? And that's, I probably missed that out on risk here. Yeah. The, the idea is actually to support decision making. 100%. Or, or to understand, to understand fully the consequences of a decision. Yeah. And so it's interesting. I always sort of, um, sometimes you've been in a meeting with a leadership group and you go, right, yeah. let's just quickly, it's almost like doing pros and cons. Yeah. Just quickly think about the risks. Benefits, disbenefits, you name it. And... You know, hopefully, as you say, you actually end up with data-driven rather than emotional, emotional decisions. Yeah. Which, um, yeah, I've seen it go wrong plenty of times. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. have, have you come across this? Like in um, New Zealand, with um, the whole "she'll be all right" mentality, the whole yeah. in, inaction. But but see, that's what the, I find that really really interesting. Like um, I I actually sit down and. Um, try and explain to people, here's the consequences of, um, or the time impact of something if we don't do something about it right now. You know, we've got to act on it immediately. Yeah. She'll be all right. Yeah, it's I'm funny like, though. she'll never be all right. I think, um, how do we, how do we get rid of, rid of inaction? And yeah, are there consequences for inaction? There but aren't though. But from a client perspective, yes. is, is it really, she'll be right? Or is the inaction more sort of based on on the fear of taking the responsibility. 
And, and could be either. A great it? example I'm thinking of is, the, uh, is you know, that idea of let's just have another review. Let's get some more information. Exactly. Let's get some more information. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and what and we time goes do, on. And what we tend to do when we're dealing with it from a project controls perspective is we say, yeah. right, you are now at a point where you are damaging, the lack of progress is damaging our project. You know, we need to be able to move on. We need to make a decision to move on. And what I've found is we feel that to be true. Yeah. But it tends to be that actually, you know, throw us a new problem and we can find a new solution, if, if you know what I mean. And what yeah, I mean yeah. by that is the fact that that decision gets delayed, we do end up finding a way to sort of make it work. But I've found that there's point. this, there's a, re, a really, a, a real scare, I guess, amongst um, project people sometimes about the consequences of making a decision, yep. which causes a type of atrophy. So it's not necessarily them saying, oh, look, everything will be fine. Yeah. It's actually their fear that it won't be and it, that paralyzing the action. And so there's examples on, I mean, there was one project I worked on where there had been a real mess up procurement wise. Right. And, you know, there was a group that, that the project had been interacting with. And I think that interaction had got to a point where from a legal perspective, the project was very exposed to the fact that they were really in a default contract, even though the actual contract itself hadn't been signed. So the contract was in default? Almost. Well, as you say, what, so what ended up happening was the, you know, I got in there and realised that the right type of procurement process hadn't been followed. We said, right, we're going to blow this open, have a bid. And this company that had been working with us missed out on that bid process. Right. So, of course, immediately came and said, hey, wait a second. We thought we were doing this. We've now missed out. I mean, we're happy to partake in the process, but now we've missed out. So, you know, there will be a claim based on the fact that we believe we've undertaken work under a shared understanding. Yeah. Which I said, yep, absolutely. And so I remember what happened was we quickly did a bit of an internal assessment, a bit of a risk assessment. We realised that they weren't only just entitled to the time that they had spent, but also what they might have expected to earn had they been contracted. Okay. So their version was that they had spent about, I think it was about three or 400,000. Yep. Working on the job. Now, had they got the job after that point, they might have expected to make two and a half million or something. Sure. So that was what I thought our true exposure was. Yep. I then set up a meeting with the company and we went in, and it was quite an informal thing when I had a cup of coffee. Mm -hmm. And the guy turned up and said, well, look, I've been given authority to make a deal. Mm -hmm. um, that deal can't be any less than. And he came back with a number that was just so much better than any of the conversations we had been having. Right. Like he was way down at more sort of 100, 150K or something. Yeah. And I thought, okay, it didn't even feel fair to me, to be honest. But yeah. um, the problem being, of course, that when you're the client, you sort of hold all that, all that power and they want to have future work. So they're a bit stuck as a contractor in that environment. Yeah. But I went back to my business and even though we'd come up with this, had been offered this wonderful deal, I still couldn't find anyone in the, in the client organisation to take responsibility for that. Wow. And sign it off. I couldn't sign it off because I didn't have the delegated authority. Right. But no one else wanted to either, just yep. because of that fear of somehow being the person who signed that form and, and the, you know, the buck stopping with them, so to speak. And, and if that company went under, somebody would be held accountable? Well, was, was that the fear? No, that was more, it was more that the, I think probably the press, the reputation, the, yep. all those sorts of things. I think yep. that's a bigger, a bigger thing about the spending of public money and that type yeah. of thing. Yep. So no one really wanted to be connected with the mistakes that had happened in the relationship yeah, with that business. Yeah, right. Interesting. And, and the reason I tell that story is just because I feel for those people, actually. That, 100%. That they're not right. given authority. Yeah, yeah. And, and the authority needs to support them when they make mistakes as well as when they get it right. Absolutely. Got to, got to back your team, right? Yeah, because we're yeah. human. And so I think the she'll be right thing, don't get me wrong, absolutely exists. But there's another side of it, especially in the construction industry and especially in the client side of the construction industry, where it's actually maybe a, an, an atrophy, a, a fear of action, you know, b based on what the consequences might so be. So it's fear of action, which leads to fear, of, which leads to inaction, though. Yeah, for sure. And, and of course, you get sent away to do another study, have another look, have another yeah. this. Let's, let's get us independent. We'll, all these different review things, which of course yeah. cost heaps of money, slow you down. I mean, we talk about why it's right. overspending. Yeah. Well, they slow you down, you spend more money. Do you get any real benefit? Well, somebody probably gets to say, well, I made sure that the money was spent legitimately. Yeah. But it's that funny thing, isn't it? You spend 150,000 to prove that 50, 50K was spent the right way. <laughs> it's just, um, 
but you know, that, that, finding that balance. That's Isn't what we're it? operating in. It is. So, it is. It, it absolutely is what we operate. So in. to give you a great example, what I've found out recently is that some of the clients in Australia are no longer approving design. Right. So they set a requirement for the project, and previously what happened is when they set a requirement, the project was built, and maybe some MR hadn't been met or something like that. The contractor would say, well, wait a second, we submitted this design and you accepted this design. Right. So we built to the design that you accepted. Interesting. And so what that did is it clouded the legal picture of responsibility. So what's happened is some of the clients have said, well, okay, well, we won't sign anything. We'll still hold you accountable to those, those MRs. We won't approve a design. Okay. You are still accountable to the MR. And again, I sit there and go, yes, they might have protected themselves legally, but are we getting the right outcome, outcome. for the project? Yeah, yeah. So there's a bigger picture there. Yeah. That it's, it's, almost like, um, it's almost like you need an ACC or something like a, a no-blame accident culture so that you can actually start getting better outcomes for your project, you know? Right. Because at the moment, and I, and I can see New Zealand hasn't gone there yet, but it, we're very, very close, and I know there's a number of litigation sitting out there already, which just hasn't previously been the Kiwi way. Yep. It's tended to be that we've negotiated and found a way. Yeah, right. I but mean, now, of course, we, we always cut deals, though, don't we? Well, we do, but of yeah. course, we've also invited in the international community into the construction industry here. Have we? Well, I, I just mean in terms of your large contractors from yeah, overseas right. that are getting yeah. the big jobs. And so, you know, that's brought a different culture, a different understanding around the commercial realities of, of delivering on construction work. Yeah. They're, they're not as ready to accept a loss based on a long-term client relationship or... Which, uh, which a normal, normal New Zealand yeah, company Kiwi would company go. probably would. Yeah, we'll go, right, I'm going to sign another deal with them for another contract, so I'm happy to take a loss on this job to make, make my money in the next. Yeah, of course, and I think people realised that taking a long-term view was, was beneficial, I guess. Yeah. But um, the problem we've got, of course, is if the, if the contractors are going to be expected to lose, then they've sort of got to be allowed to win. Yeah. And that's another side of the coin. Is yeah, that, yeah. Um, I've but but see, he, he, here's where I have a problem with it, right? So when the main contractor makes that decision for themselves, they then pass that downstream. Oh, in terms of the subbies? Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. but, but, but here's the thing, the subcontractor didn't make that choice. You know, subcontractor may not have a relationship, but then, but yeah. then that cost is still the whole passed, risk, passed downstream. Yeah, the whole right? risk and thing risk. breaks down a little bit. Yeah, it breaks it down does. because suddenly you've got you know, because you know they talk about back-to-back -back on contracts, mm -hmm. that your subcontractor becomes subject to the same terms as the, as the master contract. Yep. And that's fine, but, you know, suddenly you're dealing with a, a, small, con a small construction unit that's got two million of turnover annually or something. Yeah, yeah. On a job that's a billion. Yep. There's just no way that, a, that a, an organisation of that size should be expected to take that type of burden. Should they, should they be considered to have been held responsible for the delay of the project by a month? Yeah. At, at a cost of however, you know, 250000 a day or something. But they do feel the pain, though, eventually, time and money. Yeah, of course. Of uh, course they a, do. Yeah. But, okay, so just think about it differently, right? So if you're a risk, risk management professional, right, how do you make your skill accessible to your Tier 2, Tier 3 organisations in New Zealand? That's really... It. That's... Yeah. Yeah, because can they afford it? Um, I've asked you how you'd make it accessible. It's, it's, James, you have an amazing skill set, mate. I've, oh, I've always respected shit. that. You know, you've got a great fucking skill set. Um, how, how do we get the tier twos and tier threes in New Zealand to then go understand risk, manage risk, um, and, and, and not just yeah. push it downstream, you know? Um, because... Okay. Literally, that's all we tend to do. But if right? you think about, if you think though, um, and this is a this is a problem with consultancy. Yeah, it, it's in my interests to make what I do appear to be incredibly expert. Well, it's yeah, okay. Do you know what I mean? It's it's it, yeah. But but risk risk management's not rocket science. It's, it's common sense. And I and I always had this theory. My, my old boss in the UK, who I mean was was an actual genius. Yeah, right. Absolute most most intelligent people I've ever met. But, he, but I, he, he did what I called, he baffled his client. You he know, what? Baffled his client. Right. Showed them things that were just wonderful and incredibly yep. intelligent that they couldn't possibly ever understand. Sexy graphs and and, and you know, And that, to a certain extent, perpetuated his business. Sales but I think it's a, risky way to, it's a risky way to try and run your business. I, I prefer to do the opposite. Right. I think if I can't explain it to a normal person what's happening here, because, you know, people talk about risk management. You put it in the sausage machine and, well, James will spit out a number and, 
Well, how here's does that a, happen? No, no. Here's a risk-adjusted you, program. You know what's, uh, when you're a skilled creation. practitioner, you know what goes in, you know what it's yeah. going to create. Yeah. No, excuse me, there's no, there's no mystery. Yeah. So I've always thought, right, if, if your clients are going to fully invest, fully trust, they need to understand what the process that's happening. Yep. And risk management is not rocket science. Yep. It's um, common sense. It's, well, when we say common sense, it's it's just a process of it's quantified reviewing things through a, a certain lens. Yep. And the smaller your business, if you're at a tier two or a tier three, you probably have a project manager who takes on significantly more personal responsibility in a job because your guy at your tier one has got support. He's got yep. people around him. He's got experts around him, mm. as you say. So I think there's opportunities to train people, I guess, in some of the basics. Do you think it's valuable, though? Do they need it? Um, yeah, for sure. So, so, okay, because, so, you know, the guy at the tier twos, and, and that was an interesting thing, and I, and I hate, I even hate the concept of using tier twos because yeah, okay. tier one's hardly knocking it out of the park, you know, but it's... Um, when I was at Pitatahi, of course, you were dealing with some, with some contractors who sort of probably aspired, I guess, to improve their internal systems a bit. Mm -hmm. And what you had was a... Was a a community of these project managers who were exceptional operators right. at, at sort of managing more on the fly. Just been guys who you could give a big sight to and through incredibly hard work and high levels of trust, great relationships with their suppliers, they were able to pull together some incredible outcomes. But they weren't doing it because they had, the, had support of an audit system that gave them a set of tools in order right. to do so. It was a relationship based. They were doing it, yeah, because of their individual skills yeah. and their ability to see what was coming yeah, you know what, what, I mean? what, is, what is about to eventuate, yeah. And so they were all wonderful managers of risk based yeah. on their experience. Right. And what they'd inherited and, and learned from others. Yeah. And so I sort of feel almost like that people, you know, it's great when people switch between that sort of tier one world and that tier two world. Yeah. Because they get to share great learnings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In both ways. And, and, yeah. and I, would have, I would have said that, you know, like, um, if you want to use another analogy, I don't know how much you know about netball. Do you ever watch netball? netball? Yeah. I probably don't know anything about that man. <laughs> so netball, you've got your seven players, and there's one player called a wing defence who's probably... It's one of those roles where you'd say, if you, if you, you, know, if you have to drop a player off the court, yep. then, then it's the wing defence that you drop. Right. However, if you've got a really good one, then, man, that's like priceless to a team to have a really good wing defence. Right. So it's a funny sort of position in that you can sort of feel like it's a bit dispensable, but actually it's not really at all. Interesting. And so I think with risk management, you might say, right, well... We don't quite have the budget to employ, employ specialist risk support. You know, are we going to miss that? Well, we can sort of cope without it. Yeah. But if you do invest in it, then actually your your return your, your return is huge. How do you quantify that return? Um, it's good. I actually so, had a conversation about this yesterday. Um, yeah. So so I let's say to, hypothetically, I'm a I'm a tier two organisation. I'm going. Why should I hire James? Why do I need James? Or why do I need a risk manager? I always thought, um, it probably took me about four or five months in my first job mm. of questioning what my value was. Yeah. And I was, I'm not, not questioning it in a negative way, just sort of asking yeah, yeah. myself that 100%, question. you've got to reinforce your belief system. I sat there going, right, so I was getting paid £35,000 or something, yep, which sure. seemed like a huge amount of money to me at the time. Yeah. And with the exchange rate, it probably was. Um, <laughs> but um, I remember thinking, okay, and I did a few sums and I realised the facilitation of workshops and so on that I've done yeah. has brought rise to some solutions and some ideas and some outcomes yeah. that has probably saved a certain amount of money. Yeah. Now, I could sit there and go, right, some of those things might have happened anyway, or it might have happened yeah. only because I was able to get those people together and facilitate a conversation. Yeah. Or it might have happened naturally. You know I mean? Might have happened naturally, I don't Who know. Knows? Yeah. Yeah. But I thought, can, you know, when can I take credit? Yeah, for right. saying something has occurred now and we've got a better situation and, based on the fact that... And you influenced that. ...that I influenced it and, yeah. people, and people were part of that process. Yeah. So I started creating my own little tally. Yeah, right. And, uh, and you know, totting up yeah. what I believe to be sort of risk management savings. And um, I set myself my own little target and I thought, yeah. right, so I'm getting paid... I said, you know, I'm getting paid my 35 and my, my view sure. was that I should be saving that Minimum 35, 35. You know, on a weekly basis almost. All oh, right. Because okay. again, I was working on a project that was 1.5 billion pounds. Yeah. So, finding a way to save 35k each week wasn't that hard from the risk management context. Hang on. Were you getting paid 35k pounds a week? No, no. I was getting paid 35 pounds k annually. 
No, oh, right, okay. <laughs> but I worked out that I could save <laughs> I could save the project my annual salary on a weekly basis. Wow, that's Something a stretch like that. target, man. So suddenly you start to go, well, right, is that an investment that's worth an outcome? Yep. For sure. Oh, 100%, yeah. there's no argument there. Now, of course, when, you, when you're working to scale, it might not be quite as easy mm. because you know, there'll be some jobs where that 35,000 pounds is actually quite a significant portion of money. 100%. But it just so happened the project I was on, of course, 35,000 pounds was probably nothing. Was chimp change. So yeah. it's, um, I, I think that's the best way you can demonstrate the value. Yeah. And as you say, you're always going to have people who are doubters and it, won't, and it won't be the right thing for some organisations. Yeah, fair enough. Um, depends but, on how they set up. And but I remember too, I got in a bit of strife at a risk management conference once where, um, you know, they were talking about the problem with risk management or something like that with management, risk management today or something. And I actually made the suggestion that one of the major problems of risk management today is risk management practitioners. Right. Because you've got these risk guys who sort of exist in this esoteric world of academic risk thinking, mm. which is separate from the, you know, the delivery of good project outcomes. Mm -hmm. or, they, or they exist in a compliance world where their only purpose is to make sure the board can say that risk management is happening. Yeah. And you achieve that by having a, lo you know, a lovely looking risk register with populated actions. And, and, you, and you run tornado graphs and, and you, you come up with a PAT and number. Target, and you've got to this and you've yeah. got to that. And sure. It's nonsense but really. Yeah. 100%, it's like ex exactly what I say about a program, right? I mean, there's no point in me creating a program that the project manager would take and shove in his bottom drawer and forget about it and not even use his toilet paper. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like seriously, man, like I've, I've been in situations that that's happened, you know? Yeah. So since then, I've, I've made it my absolute mission to go, how do we communicate this? How do we communicate so it downstream? Let's, let's I've got a question for you. Go on. One thing I've always found fascinating yes. is programs that are active documents. Absolutely. How often do you see a project manager or a project director on a Friday on the site with the program? Out oh. on the site looking at some guys and going, oh, yep. So this bit's supposed to be happening. Yeah. Can you show me that? How um, are you getting on? How far through that activity are you? Um, and just as a, as a random little guideline, you know, walk the job on a Friday with the program, seeing where people are at. Almost, and, almost never. Yeah. And, uh, but, 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 yeah but hang on, hang on, James. But it's, it's I'm, okay. So <laughs> pro program is all about drawing lines on a piece of paper and, and going, I'm expecting somebody to read 2D information and relate it to a 3D real life in sight. And I'm going, hang on. Maybe the problem is not with them yet. How, how am I going to read lines on a piece of paper all, all the time, right? How about I think about it differently? How can we change the way we communicate with them? Yeah, so, yeah. so recent so you're saying in terms of what, whether a Gantt is the right way to, for a guy on the site to understand what's up there? 100%, is it? I don't think it is. And, and so, okay, yeah. so uh, 2D, right? So he's reading, he's reading lines on a piece of paper, and I expect him to know what zone I'm talking about spatially, what part of the process I'm talking about, whether it's a design, construct, procure, right? And then read logic. So you see the number of things I'm expecting him to no, understand? No, I realize that though, but if you yep. think a project, a project manager, you'd... I, I, mean, he, I always he, say he, these he things, needs to have a skill set. You'd expect, you'd expect yeah, yeah, that there's yeah, enough 100%. of a skill set that, that he, can, he can arrive on floor two he can go, right, I know where floor two is here. I can yep. see here they're supposed to be doing the internal fix on something. Agreed. And yep. they're supposed to look at the rooms around them and go, I don't see a lot of sparkies hanging around here. Looking and, after and he's tracing back to the lines on a piece of paper. Yep. So he gets to the super and he goes, wait a second, mate. Isn't there supposed to be some internal fix going on here at the moment? Yes. Yeah, that, that's, then that's all it takes, I think. Agreed. But how, how about we change the way we communicate with them? Here's an idea. To the project manager. Everybody on site. Yeah. I'm talking about the last guy that puts a brick literally puts a brick in Simonson, puts a jib wall up, puts timber framing up, the last guy that does it. Mm. How do we communicate to him, right? Because he's the only guy really adding value. Yeah, any last planner practitioner will tell you that. The guy who's actually doing the work yeah, is the course. only guy who's adding value. Mm. Everybody else is a support function, right? Mm. Okay, so I'm going, so I've been thinking about some crazy cool ideas on how to create little, inspired by TikTok again. Um, Mate, I love TikTok, don't get me wrong. It's a, hey, <laughs> hey, hey, a lot of people hate it. You're a younger man than I am, Andy. No, mate, a lot of people hate it. Different forms of communication. One, one minute learning. It's, it's absolutely amazing, mind-blowing. Love it, right? So how do we get one minute learning to the guys who are actually installing the timber framing? 
yeah, little snippets of videos. Why not? Yeah, and 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 I think they'll learn more from that one minute than they might. You, and um, and then but you standing there, but getting them viewing the right piece of information at the exactly. right times to inform the right Bang activity is, is is the tricky part. Hang on, that he cares about. That he cares about. Yeah. If he's a timber framer, right? Um, he's a carpenter, and all he cares about is getting that timber frame in at that particular point in time. But what does he need to know? The spatial location of where he is, or where, where he needs to do what, hmm. when, how, and why. Simple. We get that information communicated to him at the right moment. Bob's your uncle. You, you know what I mean? Like, like literally, why, why complicate it with 50-page with programs? Mate, my grade oh. 50 page programs, like, I, no, no, oh, sure. mate, I've, for sure, yeah. I've, I've done that, no problem. Yeah. And they say but, the same thing about risk registers. I, I met an overseas expert guy who always said, you have your big risk register. Yep. And he said, from that big risk register, you'll have five items that the whole organization needs to know care about. But he said, then you get down to the next tier, and you need to be able to find a way to express to every individual in that project team what their five key risks are yeah. in, in their world. And those are the ones he said they have on their desk. That's the daily, the daily I'm aware of these risks thing. Yeah. And you know, and they connect obviously with what's happening to those big five for the project. Yeah. But I thought th there was some power in that, and it takes some. Um, yeah. Takes a bit of energy. It, it to, does to create. But, that. Okay. But but James, the way we communicate is changing, right? It's it's normal fifty page programs. It's it's normal all of that. It's it's one minute videos. It's 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 that. And I get that. I get that. Th that's what innovation me, goes. But we just talked play. before about the foundation. Yep. And, and I feel like there's this, um, you know, all this sort of different forms of communication stuff sits in that sort of innovative space. And there's a whole heap of what I might, you know, you might call them sort of construction truths or planning truths or which you just can't get away from. You can't get away from the benefit of the boring work. I'm, I'm not saying of, you do not do planning, the planning, fundamentals planning. right. I'm saying you have to have a good work breakdown structure. You have to have a good cost breakdown structure. You have to have a good model design breakdown structure. You've got to have a good organizational breakdown structure people that you hold all of that accountable to, but interrelate all of that data, right? Okay, say 20 years ago, man, you know, would you ever imagine pulling out your phone and saying, I want to go to this address, punch the address, and it gives you an address. Oh. I mean, it gives you a complete route Incredible. with traffic information. Chuck it on your dashboard, and away you go. And how indispensable does that feel now? Hey, Incredible. today I can't live without it. Can you? Amazing, eh? Wait, Amazing. Um, I still remember my dad kind of opening up this little map book. Oh, yeah, the Atlas, the little yeah, map book. Yeah, yeah. My parents have still got one. Did they? Car. Yeah. That's really cool. They ignore Do the they... fact that there's a navigation system in there, <laughs> on their dash. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me your dad keeps it in the passenger yeah, side. the passenger under side. The... Oh, yeah. Passenger side thing. I just about knocked it out. I borrowed their car and knocked it out the other day. Yeah. And you know, you start, start referring pages and all of that. Oh. But look at how we evolve, James. But we have to evolve. I, no, I think. for sure. No, no, I, I completely get that. No, I, yeah, and, and, and yes, we've got to do the background work. Do you, do you think Google doesn't do the background work? They've mapped every single street. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, so they've mapped it with structure. It's still a product of something, yeah. Right, so if they didn't map every single street, sent a car to drive every single street so you can put a little man on your Google Maps and see what it looks like. So it, you, it's, you asked me about conveying value. Yes. So how do you do that then? How, how are you doing the same thing? I mean, I know you've got a whole heap, whole heap of tools and all that sort of thing. Yes. But how are you, what, how, I mean, I say it's a value proposition. I don't know what people call it, your pitch or whatever. My pitch, what does yeah. yours look like? Yeah. Um, so, so every project I go on is a bit different, right? So we worked in AR all together. That was, that was different. That was, mm. um, as you know, I, you brought me in for a purpose, right? Um, I may go on and represent a contractor Right, and, um, but the fundamental is always the same for me. So it's having structure, having that fundamentals, the base set, right? Mm -hmm. So every job I go on to, um, nine times out of 10, I've taken a program on from somebody else that's tried to write that program. And 100% of the time, the first thing I tell them is, um, we've got to rewrite the program. <laughs> So and what let's you, establish a work breakdown structure. Yeah. What do you call that? Like, because I've been trying to explain this to people recently, the blocks. Like, and I say it's the big building blocks. Yeah. Taking a, a, an overall view and being, being able to describe, and some people might call it staging. Sure. 
how are we going to deliver this job yep. in a meaningful, structured way? Yep. And that meaningful, structured way obviously has to complement what your sort of operational units is. Yes. And um, there's projects I'm, I'm on that are still struggling to assert this. Yep. What, what is the working unit? Who, who is a person who will be responsible for what scope of work? And how, exactly. do, we, how do we establish our organisation to support that work? It all starts with a good work breakdown structure change. Mm. So, you know, so... Um, and even if within what, that work breakdown structure, you're grouping. You say these sort of four elements will be a zone or, or whatever. Exactly, though. Yeah. See, here's the key thing, I think, that, that people miss. So, so let's say at level one, you've got the whole project. I classify that as spatial element. So, so in my mind, it's really simple, mm. right? It's either spatial or it's part of a process. Yeah? So spatial element, entire project. Then I want to break that down into a subspatial element. Yeah. So I want to call it building one, building two. Sure. Get a demarcation map for it. I will not create a work breakdown structure. They don't give me a demarcation map. Yep. I will refuse. Okay. I will hang on, stop and blatantly refuse. And then take it to the next level down. Right. Now you want to incorporate process. Cool. That's the highest level of process though. What is it? Substructure, superstructure. Fit out, facade, okay. But at that level, you've only got that. Now let's break it down to the next level that you're talking about. Now we're going subspatial. Within part of the structure, you want to group floor level one, floor level two, floor level yeah. three, floor level yeah. four. I mean, I'm talking about a BNI job, obviously, but, but it's that consistency. But the trick is now getting your QS to work with you to then align your costings yeah. to that. That's really, really. So how do you how do you cover off then when you've got system wide, when you because I mean we're battling with this at the moment where um, they want to view the utilities as a system wide issue rather than as a zoned issue. Yeah. And I'm still battling a little bit because they're both sort of true, especially from the design perspective. Yeah. Excuse me, you've actually got to be matrix. Yeah. In the sense that you can't design this portion of the utilities plan without With, without the whole floor, without yeah, the understand. whole floor. And from a delivery perspective too, you sort of want to deliver that in one run. And and, and you want to start from the east and work to the west, sure. And so that how do you, is. from a WBS perspective, account for, I mean, would you still be zoning that section of utilities from a WBS perspective, or would you be double coding, or how would you? No, so see, here's what I think we're doing. We, we need, we need, I think we need to start thinking about it differently, right? So um, we've, we've always gone, right, let's create a program that works from some set 2D drawings and from some guy's head, or a couple of guys, methodology that they've developed yeah. in their head, right? And then we're going to put all of that in paper. I'm saying, let's change that. Let's, let's start from a 3D model, right? Get our 3D model coded to what I would call, I don't know, a, a project data structure for, mm. sorry, I just made that word up. Yeah. yeah, I know what you mean though. Yeah. yeah, so a project data structure. So if I can click on an element in a 3D model, and I go, right, that element on a 3D model now has a series of metadata coded to it. It belongs to this zone, this part of the process, whatever, you know? So it's got a series of metadata, and it doesn't matter whether it's health and safety, whether it's quality. If I, if I now want to report a health and safety incident, It'll you'd have to click on, a, click on a 3D model and a location within the 3D model to report the incident, which would then automatically tag all those incidents. Quality, doesn't matter, same thing. If I'm creating a program, Created from the 3D model. Why, why do I have to now reviews 100 pages of drawings? Hang on, that's only structural. Then there's architectural. <laughs> then there's fire. I keep going, man. It's like, it's like I'm just reviewing paper after paper after paper. It's insane. It drives me mental. Right? So we, we have the 3D capability. We've always had it. We've had it for 20 years now. Yeah. Mm. More than that, I, I think. So. We just I haven't worked out how to leverage it properly. Exactly. And I think there's a real opportunity to leverage it. Right, um, but but for which we need good structure, a structured way of working, which I, which I don't think we have yet, and 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 that's where we need to focus our efforts and energy on to get to that point. Yeah, I, f I feel like we've been affected a little bit too. In the, I mean, I, I never existed in this world, but apparently there was a time when um, you'd have a large crew employed by by Fletcher's say, yeah, that all sort of worked on projects for Fletcher's, mm -hmm. and when that job was finished they were largely, as a mass, were able to move to the next job I, I had and sort story. of continue yeah. Yeah, to, yeah. to operate, especially in the building interiors yep. side of things. So your Sparkies, all these guys you're, were all your employed. Your Sparkies, your Chippies, your everybody. Yeah. And what that meant, of course, is that the maturity of system development that you're talking about could occur because you had the same crews maturing together 
from job to job, learning together. Yep. Whereas what we're what I'm finding we've got now is that you just it's very you've got to go through a whole new forming process each. I mean, I suppose you have to do that anyway, but that forming process yep. probably takes longer because you're incorporating so much of a disparate set of of people who don't have familiarity with each other in the same way. Can yep. I challenge that thinking? And it's partly a basis. Yeah, I mean, of course. But it's partly on the basis of the fact that our industry hasn't been able to get that consistency of, of relationship on either client side or the contractor side. Yeah. But do you think it's a system and a process problem as opposed to a people problem? Because uh, I'll come back to Google again. And I respect Google as an organization, so I'll come back to Google again. And if, and if, and if Google said, you know, um, um, why do I have to drive on every single street to map it? Why do I have to spend resources, money, time, energy to, to drive onto every single street on planet Earth to map it? What do you think it would be? So, you know, is, so I, I think they saw the value in the system and the process as opposed to being completely reliant on people. So can we systemize what we do? Can we get the designers on board to then, to then have a standard coding structure for their models? You know? What do you um, mean, like an industry standard? 100%. It's been tempted in some ways, hasn't it? But yes, but then, okay. Uh, have you ever picked up a 3D, 3D model and checked to, up properties? Uh, everyone so? seems to be able to find exceptions, don't they? And therefore, it sort of debases hey, it. Everybody makes subtle changes and then that just blows the whole thing out. But have you ever clicked on a, clicked on a model, um, one element in a model, and gone and checked out the properties and see how much of metadata there is in that? Yeah, a little bit. I've been showing the process through GIS and stuff. Insane. Yeah. They, but everybody does that differently. I'm saying, why don't we get everybody into a group of people together? <laughs> oh, dangerous territory. Sorry. Okay. No, no, no. <laughs> Hang on. But, I but, completely yeah. agree. It's very logical. But, e but even I've found within, um, you know, within the Fletcher's JDE setup, they created a, you know, a sort of set of coding and so on that they would like to see consistently against their projects. Yeah. But that coding set still restricts you on the ah, basis of the unique properties hang on, of the Hang project. on. Here's the thing, right? Okay. So now... Let's say you caught a model up with, in, with, with the relevant metadata that you want, or the levels of structure that you want to see, right? And I'm a planner, and I want to see spatial, spatial, process, spatial, process, whatever. Then that's how I want to see the program, right? It's, all it is is interchangeability levels, right? Once you've got, let's say, a, a global project data structure, if as a QS you want to alter that, it's just dragging and dropping levels. Because now we're interrelated data and it's just dragging and dropping levels. Why shouldn't we be allowed to do that? You know? It's about giving the people the freedom of choice, I think. I don't know. What do you think? I don't know. I'm, 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 I'm blabbering. No, no, I know what you mean. Sorry, Dave, just for your answer, we're about to hit an hour and these Oof. people might want to start to. <laughs> do we hit an hour? Sheesh. Like, it's good, keep going. We're just, um, we're just trying to keep it between. Might blow my nose. Do we hit an hour? Almost, yeah, yeah. We've got, we've got some time to sort of start to finish up with this to do the thing. Sorry, man. What's the big statement? What's the big closing statement? Oh, I don't know, James. Uh, mate, um, I feel, I mean, I, I, I think the, the most important aspect is that we're talking about a system that, and, I, and I'm talking about New Zealand's construction industry as broken, and we're not the only one. I mean, I think it's a worldwide issue. And it's broken because of all these fundamental levels at which we're... And I, I think the biggest issue, personally, I think the biggest issue is that we're not prepared to grapple with the true cost of, of the work that we do. And when I say the true cost, I mean, you know, how much it actually costs to build these things. Yeah. And so we constantly battle with... Um, and I completely understand this. Your clients who want to get the most as they possibly can for their dollar and that, those type of things. But we've sort of set up a process. And even though we've had this construction accord and all that type of stuff, we're not really seeing the behaviours that the construction accord wants to perpetuate. We're not seeing those in our And um, revising NZ3910 and so on and so forth. That's been going on for a while. Yeah, of but course. And, I would, yeah. and it's we're largely not because we're not really prepared to grapple with the true cost of, of delivering the work. Now, admittedly, people might say, well, our project management standards aren't great. Hey, absolutely. Things would be cheaper if our project management was better. But it's, as, as we said before, it's a cyclical thing. Yeah and that we need to have more money to invest in improving our project management standards. Yeah, for and, sure. You know, we need to be training our project managers to think in some of the terms that you've talked about with the way that they use their programs and the way Not that they, they really Design. use, yeah, the Cost. way they really use the tools. Yeah. And so, and those individuals won't get to achieve that without the net, you know, the whole network being supported by, by a bit more profit.
Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. So I don't quite know how we manage so that. We just need to find that balance in the industry, you reckon? Well, of course, because it's expensive to do this stuff, and and we, and it's too it's too expensive. It really is. <laughs> yeah. It is. I mean, remember when we were first talking about light rail and, and the yeah. numbers that started coming out? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It just seems like such an insane amount of money. Yeah, yeah. But then, I tell you, it's not going to get any cheaper. I mean, look at Christchurch and the stadium down there. And yeah. the longer they choose, they keep making decisions or, or delaying decisions, yeah. the whole thing gets more expensive. So yeah, For sure, 100%. And, and I remember I actually got exposed to that from a risk perspective, the risk of not acting now. Yeah. Not doing it now. Yeah. Because it yeah. doesn't get cheaper. The best time to act is now. Oh, Absolutely, mate. So, but anyways, man. Um, but thank you so much for that really, really interesting chat. Yeah, uh, good. I, I really enjoyed that. That was that was amazing. And thank you for being my second guest. Right. Um, is there anything you want to tell the general people? <laughs> Not particularly. No. We're good. Good times, right, mate. mate. Thank good you so much, you. James. Thank you so much for coming on again. Take um, care. Really enjoyed that. Yeah. For sure, mate. Cheers. New time.